here today at One Bird Cage Walk for the first national seminar of the Transport Knowledge Hub. The Hub uniquely brings together local enterprise partnerships, local and central government, and the transport community to encourage investments which will facilitate inclusive and sustainable economic growth. We've got some really exciting speakers today. We've got Lewis Atter and Tony Travers. So there's going to be lots of really interesting information, hopefully some great discussions around the tables. I sit on the Hub board and I think it's fundamental in terms of trying to uh, promote and make better understood the value of public transport to driving or contributing to economic growth. Welcome to this Transport Knowledge Hub event. The Transport Knowledge Hub is jointly funded by Greener Journeys and the Department for Transport. Transport is central to unlocking growth and it can be transformative for local economies. We know, for example, that investment in local bus infrastructure can deliver more than eight pounds of net economic benefit for every one pound invested. This morning, my role is really to explain why the next two presentations matter so much. There is a relationship between connectivity and productivity. We might get half the 33% productivity target overall for the North if we got about a 300% increase uh, in connectivity. City region perspective on this. If we invest a pound up front, 15 plus years later, I might get my annual city region GVA up by between £1.30 and £2. Those relationships between pounds spent and GVA outcomes can be translated into a view about percentage of our economy invested. The best spend rate anywhere in the country that's being delivered at the moment, 0.5% of GVA a year. I think we should be planning in terms of about 1% a year. So we've clearly got to do better than that. This question of uh, land value capture out of transport schemes, not just does it exist, but also can you that last word of the three, can you actually capture it and use it? I think there are two market failures and a tax failure behind this. We don't actually charge for public transport what some people are prepared to pay. Clearly, in a city like London, indeed in most areas, as people value being near the new transport, that value feeds into the existing property market and people are prepared to pay a premium to be near that new transport. And then the third thing is, in the UK, the links between existing property and the tax system, particularly on the residential property side, are relatively weak. It's taxed if there's a transaction, it's taxed if somebody dies, and that's about it. I'm going to talk about trying to quantify uh, land value uplift so I'm just going to go through some of the case studies that we looked at. Um, so the first one is the Jubilee Line extension. The uplift in values around the stations was greater than the control areas. Next example, DLR extension to, to Woolwich Arsenal. Overall, uh, there is evidence of an, an uplift in value. There's two local factors that will influence the uplift. One is the regeneration potential of the area. And then the second question is to what degree the area has parts of it that are attractive and appealing to people already. So it now gives me great pleasure to hand over to Professor Tony Travers of the London School of Economics, who will chair our panel discussion. To owners of homes, the rise in the value is seen as a human right. It's doomed for this reason. <laughs> You're right, it's doomed under a business as usual approach to this. The entire use of property taxes is tangled up in this entirely sensible uh, discussion. All I can say is I think one has to keep sort of pushing. Is there an unintended consequence that will make the affordability of housing in an area if we focus on land value capture even more acute? Is there any thoughts from the panel about how we might be able to apply some of the positive stuff out of land views capture. I think people are far more interested in what is the economic partnership. I mean, there is somebody there to ring up. It depends what the question is, who you would ring up. <laughs> How does the North help pay for what is described as regional infrastructure, but actually is, is possibly national infrastructure? I think that's still quite a good um, model that maybe we can, we can learn from for the future. 
I, I just want to say a absolute huge thank you to all of you for, for coming. This has been a brilliant morning. Um, but also a very, very special thank you for our speakers again. So my mind is a little bit blown because I thought the quality of argument and insight was, was really strong. The challenge, I think, for the, for the hub is how can we make a case about getting this it's a revolution really in the sort of corridors of power and taking it forward. For me, it's very interesting to hear the, the different viewpoints and the issues that people are facing. And, um, and perhaps we should do a little bit more of it. Well, I think the really great thing about the day was the mix of the theoreticians, the people who are doing, um, uh, you know, desk work on the techniques, and the practitioners who've actually got to make it work at local level. I think it's something we can all learn from each other, both in central government and in local government, and, in, and I guess in businesses as well. It's easy for us to sit in Manchester thinking, we haven't got any answers, or even worse, that we've got all the answers. And the only certain thing is that we haven't. So, you know, in terms of a networking event as well as a learning event, I think it's great. The Hub presents a huge opportunity to share information and best practice and to forge new partnerships and collaborations. Collectively, we can achieve so much more.